Yes, it was. It was also to, to set aside competing voices and state clearly what the Australian government's voice was, as opposed to former leaders, perhaps, who might have contrary views. But uh, asserting the current, the Albanese government's view, uh, Penny Wong, the overarching concept that she used was to introduce Australia to an era of balance of power politics. In other words, uh, no longer hegemonic politics, no longer Australia able to attach itself to a single great power, a single great ally, but to participate in a broader balancing uh, exercise. And in essence, that means, and she didn't shy away from using the word China either, Bev, interestingly, she was pretty straightforward. In essence, it means uh, gathering countries which are opposed to China's uh, coercion and dominance and gathering those countries together to balance against China's increasing power. And the thing that was clearly stated, all, although um, maybe a little understated, in her remarks was that she said we need more countries, more players to join this balancing exercise on Australia's side. And it's not just the Quad. I mean, the, the Quad nations were one of the clearest signs that, you know, classical uh, balance of power politics were at play when the US, Japan, India and Australia joined. Uh, and the next summit of the Quad will be held in Australia in just a few weeks. Um, but many more countries as well. And she said, uh, unless we need more countries, more players to join the balancing, uh, if it is to be durable. In other words, she's anticipating a growth in Chinese power over the years ahead and is saying that more countries need to balance on Australia's side with its like-minded countries to balance against increased Chinese power, if it is to be durable. In other words, she's saying she doesn't think that the current constellation is sufficient. Um, this is the stark picture that she drew. Yeah. Her, she also made it clear that it was sort of this notion of respecting but not deferring to others, and particularly when it comes to the, the government's approach to China. Is that a shift that is going to yield results from China? Well, if you look at, I think if you look at the current developments, you'd say it's already uh, getting some benefits, getting some uh, advances. This government has talked about a stabilisation policy, which is, uh, which is you know, a great uh, temporary framework because destabilisation surely lies ahead because that's at the heart of China's strategic purpose is to destabilise the current arrangement in favour of an arrangement that looks more favourable to China. But at heart, it's about a, a temporary stabilisation, uh, speaking softly and yet carrying a big stick in the famous Teddy Roosevelt formulation the big stick, well, one of the big sticks was the further development of the AUKUS concept of Australia acquiring more nuclear powered, acquiring its first nuclear powered submarine, submarines. And next week, we're going to hear from the federal government the De Defence Strategic Review, which is going to be its plan for strategy and uh, military acquisitions to gear Australia for the next 20 years. So uh, it's, it's, yes, as you say, in her formulation, it's uh, respect. Uh, don't go out of your way to provoke or insult or gratuitously offend China or any country, but certainly don't defer either. Yeah. And, you know, it's been very clear uh, the Albanese government has not resiled from any of the positions, the very strong and more overt positions that the Morrison government took. But is that going to be a policy, that Ch a sort of approach that China is prepared to tolerate for now um, and, and, you know, back away this, from this kind of economic coercion that they were using on us before? Well, it's interesting, isn't it, that uh, just in the last few days, the federal government has announced a formal ban on the Chinese-owned and extremely popular app TikTok on official devices. Uh, it's heightened the commitment to the AUKUS partnership and clarified exactly how that's going to work. And yet, while these uh, moves to defend Australia essentially against Chinese encroachment are underway, at the very same time, we see the Chinese government relaxing the trade ban that it applied uh, punitive uh, boycotts to Australian tariffs just a couple of years ago. So those two things are proceeding at the same time.
And of course, all the while, we can't ignore um, what China is doing around Taiwan, you know, constant intimidatory tactics, and also these revelations that even on Australian soil that you've made, um, that we've seen recently with police cars, police stations in Australia, again now in the United States, this is a policy of intimidation that China is happy to carry out on our, our own soil and other countries' soil. Yeah, and the particulars about the Chinese uh, putting these unofficial, uh, undeclared police stations and in a particular detail police cars in other countries, including Australia, this is something that's been going on for a very long time, Bev, uh, and that I treated uh, in my book a couple of years ago. The first uh, reference to this in public was 2005. So we're talking nearly 20 years ago when a Chinese defector who was a political attaché to the Chinese consulate in Sydney, Chen Yonglin was his name, he defected to Australia and said at that time that he'd heard discussions in the consulate of a couple of specific cases of kidnappings of uh, Chinese Australians being rendered back to China. Um, and in 2018, the US policy magazine Foreign Policy, Zach Dorfman wrote a piece quoting former US officials saying that there were uh, quite a number of known cases within the intelligence community of Chinese Australians being just snatched. So Ministry of State Security uh, officials would come into Australia undeclared on tourist visas, grab Chinese Australians, um, put them on boats. Uh, some were drugged, some were thugged, uh, some were simply coerced, their family members in China threatened and forced to return to China for persecution or prosecution either for corruption charges uh, or because they were political enemies of uh, the, the ruling clique or usually both of the above. So that's been, that's been going on for a very long time. What we now see is some of the more, uh, some more of the mechanics of how that's been happening are being exposed and governments are finding the will to shut them down. And is that important to make these arrests like we've seen in New York to actually not tolerate them quietly or react to them quietly? That's precisely right, uh, Bev, because the government here but other governments were so protective of the economic relationship that they uh, essentially they traded off the rights of the, the Chinese citizens, Chinese people who were, who were living in their country, in our case, uh, Australian citizens who happened to be of Chinese descent, essentially traded off their rights, let China exercise extraterritorial rights over their freedom and their bodies and their um, habeas corpus and simply letting them be spirited away to, to protect the economic side of the relationship. Now that that phase is over, certainly in Australia's case, uh, governments are prepared to speak openly about this. And that's critically important, not just to deter further Chinese interference, but to give the Chinese Australian community of whom there are 1.3 million very valuable Australian citizens whose rights need to be protected and they can take some more confidence uh, in knowing that Australian officialdom and Australian governments will stand up for them and won't simply buckle uh, under the force of Chinese uh, illegal and extraterritorial renditions. Fascinating juggling act. Good to have you on. Thanks, Peter. Pleasure, Bev.